We're thrilled to have you back for another episode, which happens to be our 249th of Human Humane Architecture on FinTech Hawaii. And you are about to be around our 13,200 year, which we're thrilled. We is us, your hosts at the contrary nodes of our round globe back in our Honolulu, Hawaii at the tropical exotic Asipov Design Brown residence with you, DeSoto. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody, and uh, hello, Think Tech, and hello, Martin. So lovely to have your tropical exotic birds singing, dogs sleeping uh, scenery there, which I'm happy, very happy. And me, your other host, Martin Despang, has moved from Zurich, where we were around Zurich last week, back to Dresden on the eastern side of Germany, and it's uh, dark here, so the birds went to sleep. Otherwise, there would be some here too. So um, we're still operating under the challenging uh, clouds of COVID, cases going up, climate change continued to be and everything overshadowed by the threat of civility through wars in many places. One that I'm getting closer and closer to here geographically moving around because Dresden is just close to the Czech border. And Dresden is also the town where dictator Putin says this is his favorite town that he has ever lived in. So um, as we were talking to Soto, uh, luckily uh, there was a gift store where we saw a little postcard that was saying uh, Putin, and there was uh, someone throwing the head of Putin into a uh, bin, a waste paper bin. So obviously there are people here who don't are, are quite don't have quite so romantic feelings about Putin when he was here as a KGB agent back in the days. So this is the operating umbrella we're talking about. Uh, but get us back to the uh, first slide. And related in many ways are exotic escapism expert Susanna, uh, who is one of our utmost fans, but also critics gave me uh, a rain check uh, last week when I was doing that show uh, because of what, DeSoto? We talked about that before. Well, you were saying that uh, you were comparing home ownership between Switzerland and uh, the United States. And you were pointing out that the high, the really high level of median income in Switzerland is around $10,000 a month. And that's what's considered uh, decent wages for, for them, certainly. Um, but what you were saying was that uh, because of that high income, people were able to live more comfortably and to attain in an ironic way something more like the American dream. But Suzanne pointed out that the American dream is home ownership. And what's going on in Switzerland is not ownership, but in fact is renting. So it's a different situation, but what you're saying is that what people can afford to live in as a rental place in Switzerland is far superior than what they can afford to live in as a rental place in the United States for comparable money. So it's a more equitable situation and a more comfortable and a more livable and decent living situation in Switzerland. And in a larger sense, of course, what we're talking about is European countries having offering a great deal more for citizens, which they pay for through higher uh, taxes as well. And that's something that a lot of people in the United States get insane about because how dare you raise my taxes and how dare you try to impose socialism when in fact, it's uh, a totally different situation. But nonetheless, the two, the two Switzerland and United States situations are not exactly comparable which is what we talked about before the show. Yeah, and on the left, we see the map of Germany, or at least the large majority of it, the very west and the very east is cut off a little bit. But uh, this is from a real estate uh, sort of, you know, on, on the phone app where you can check the value of your home. And the legend at the very bottom there is color coded. It's basically the, the more heaty, the more yellowy, the more orangey, and the more reddish it gets, uh, the hotter the market is. I guess that's how they choose the color, I can only imagine. 
and the colder and the bluer it gets, uh, the, the cooler the prices are. So you can see here clearly that um, it's very hot and red where Suzanne is from. That's why we have a similar, we're talking about the comparisons of Hawaii and Bavaria, uh, which I call cynically the uh, Department of Bavarian Homeland trap she is in with her house. Uh, I use that term to echo the Department of, uh, of Hawaiian Homeland, which is where locals can't afford a home anymore. We're talking ownership now, and that's very similar here. The other hot spot is there was a show way back uh, that we called um, uh, Hamburg's Harbor City uh, um, and call, uh, compared that to Kaka'ako. This is Hamburg. This is another red zone here. Other than that, um, in the east, we have Dresden, where we currently are, uh, but only in the metropolitan area around Dresden, everything else very quickly goes uh, rather, uh, cools off uh, to the blue. And this is still the former east, which still, you know, many decades after the wall came down is still trying to catch up with the west. There's still discrimination there as far as wages and opportunities and economical challenges. And uh, where we were uh, basically the last couple of days was back with Joey and Lenny and their ladies at the very west in the Kolen pot in Duisburg. And that's where all the steel industry, all the heavy industry went away. And that's why it's only in the areas of Bonn, Cologne and Dusseldorf, it's yellowish, but everything else cools off rather to, uh, to greenish. So that's basically the the kind of the, the mapping of, um, of, of uh, economical situations. And so again, uh, what is true for Munich as like the 6,000 uh, euros per square meter, uh, which is insane, but it's equally insane in Honolulu. Uh, so that no normal person, and this is something that when Ron was still with us, you know, brought that up. Uh, getting back to our, our show here, and I think we can bring up the next slide for that. The area around Ala Moana, uh, where uh, this one is the volume uh, 13, um, us elaborating on that one, where basically, um, you know, this is, this is not affordable. The, the, the projects there um, that um, we are talking about, uh, what they call affordable is not affordable for normal people. It's still, you're still privileged if you can afford something in that, in that area. That's rather, um, rather shocking. And so what else do we have on, on that slide here to compare things? Uh, we said that the building that's supposed to be on that lot here will be by the star architect Rem Kolas and his firm Oma. And us having the, uh, that's, you see that on the show quota number one, on number six, uh, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of our favorite Olympics in Munich and its Olympic Village going along with it that we pointed out as something to learn from. So that is 50 years young now. And there's an initiative in the city that's already projecting for the next 50 years. So how can we basically evolve that tradition of innovation as we like to call it, you know, one of your favorite talks about that subject matter in Honolulu. So just hot off the press, this is slide number two, is that the same Rem Kolhas um, was chosen as a winning uh, competition entry for uh, what they call the urban production for BMW. So here we have the private sector that is stepping up and hiring, you know, well-known architects, which is a good thing. Again, um, slide number three, um, they did this before with Wolf Pricks, who uh, you know, made the mistake to team up with Putin. Uh, and also we think with this BMW world uh, was doing more of a silly attempt to live up to the great Fry Otto and get the Banish with their sort of um, you know, flying roofs. And so we can only wish that uh, Rem will basically uh, you know, do better and live up to his full potential as uh, the public sector has done. Because what do we see on the slides uh, seven, eight, nine, the solo that we were talking about and you got excited about? 
Well, you were talking about this uh, earlier, and if I'm not mistaken, these are prefab sl slabs, essentially, which are being installed. They're wooden, however, they're not concrete and they're not steel. Um, and this is a new complex, and it has got this tremendous overhang. And uh, tell me more about it, because we talked about it, but this is, uh, you need to inform me again yeah. and our audience. This is, once again, we get later to our main uh, educational institution, which is my employer, the University of Hawaii, that should have a leading position in most of things. We're a tier one research institution, so we should do cutting edge built research as buildings. And there's a great tradition, as there is in Honolulu, uh, to build upon, because mid-century architects were doing that. Here, they continue to do that because this is for the Technical University of Munich. This is an athletics building here. Uh, and again, a win, a one competition by the Austrian firm of Dietrich Untertrifala. I don't ask you to say that because this is a tongue breaker. And this is a very, very good firm. And again, they were, you know, uh, building as you already described, this is prefab wood. Uh, pushing it to the max as far as cantilevering there. This is all, again, doesn't need any scaffolding. It could be set up, you know, with a crane. And that reminds us a lot at the top right. What, should, what is that? Well, that it, at the top right is uh, one of our favorites, and that's the Ala Moana building. And the Ala Moana building is, or was, I should say, when it was first constructed, extremely innovative and very livable and very much ahead of its time. Uh, it no longer has the features that it originally had, which is too bad, but that is something that we look to as a role model for what buildings can be in terms of their energy usage in particular and the comfort of the people who are inside them. Yeah, and that reminds me of the one and only time I had the chance to meet the great Alfred Yi that Bunda did this great exhibit about that's up online of his Chen Gallery and this is pulled from, from his website. And uh, Al basically shared with me that story that his very first building in downtown Honolulu that doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. He had this ambitious idea to make it all free spanning without any interior columns spanning around the whole width of the block slash the building. And once he had designed that, he found out, oops, I, I forgot about the lack of buildability almost. He says there's like, where is, so he had to go back and actually design the tools, the cranes, and he got himself inspired by basically Sand Island and all the shipping cranes, cargo cranes, and he designed the tools to put the beams in place. But um, in terms of being mid-century and you know where he was, I guess he was on a budget, he basically designed it in a way that was almost Egyptian, that was like people powered. So there were like all these people who had to basically push these cranes. And when they first started, it didn't go anywhere. It didn't move an inch where he was scratching his head. By that time, he said there were like articles in the paper popping up. There's this silly young engineer who's already basically done by the time he starts his business because it's not figured out. So he was like really under pressure, put himself under pressure. And then it was like, he realized it's like, if you have like a chair that's on wheels, has like, you know, five horizontal legs and they're, they're, they're rolling ball, you know, underneath and when they're all point in a different direction your chair doesn't move anywhere so he had to like synchronize like a ballet to first have them straighten out the rolls and then go in the right direction and they were able to do it and, and that that was just so fantastic to hear from himself like his sort of his beginnings they were overly ambitious and and so enthusiastic and but just like his pure will and passion finally made it happen so that's why it reminds me of when I when I read about this project here, they talk about, oh, we don't we didn't want to use any scaffolding. We wanted to make it very efficient and effective. We wanted to make it out of wood as the most sustainable material. So I was like feeling there is the same kind of spirit in there 
that once again, coming full circle here, where are we going with this one? We're, we're hoping that the, 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 the private sector here, BMW, is getting inspired by that. And also um, kind of lack of ego, it would probably be too easy to basically have Dietrich Untertrifala say, oh, we want to basically uh, homage to the great Fry Otto with, I think, a good portion of, I guess, um, you can probably say patriotic patriotism of them being Austrian. They actually allude to their architect in that area, which is Paul Schwanza, who basically built the four cylinder like BMW headquarter towers that BMW built for uh, or around the event of the Olympics because they wanted to look good, mighty good. And so we're innovative as well. because We're the BMW, we're a leading automotive company in the area and in the world. So once again, coming full circle, hopefully here, the, uh, the, the private sector, which we also encourage our university, we unfortunately have to share later on in, in, in this show here, the next week, so in however many volumes we still need, that uh, actually QH is currently doing the opposite, but hopefully they're going back to their, their roots and their tradition. And then the, 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 the private sector is following that good raw model of, uh, of the public sector. All wishful thinking, uh, a little bit more about, I guess, you know, when they're branded as Midtown Ella Moana, it sounds like a new thing, right? You know, all their buildings popping up left and right in pretty much the same manner it is. But in fact, if we look at the picture, the sort of the, the pioneering step of, of further developing that area in the way they do it right now as, as high-end housing, that foundation was laid earlier, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and the whole district of Kapilani Boulevard has undergone a lot of different changes in its existence since the 1930s when it was first built. And in the background of this photograph, we can see on the left what's called the Luraku Tower, which was built in the 1990s by a Japanese firm. And it is a high-end uh, residence. It's a high-end condo. And next to it on the right, in the center of this picture, is the central. This is a new, one of these new condos. And one of the things we always point out is the new buildings are all blue. They're all sheathed in blue glass. The central is like that as well. But if we go back to the 90s, Luraku is a different greenish color. Now, Luraku, to its, to its credit, does have lanais. It does have some level of livability. And one of the things that we always advocate is, Every building should have lanais. Every building should have open and openable and closable windows. Uh, Luraku does. Central does to a less, a limit, more limited extent. And we do not like the fact that too many of the buildings being built right now, not only in Ala Moana, but other places, are just solid blocks of unopenable and unclosable glass, which we don't like. The, what we're talking about in terms of what's going to happen and what we're looking at is the building lot in the foreground. And this is at the Eva end of Ala Moana Center. It's next to the parking building of Ala Moana. And it's also where there currently is a small 1980s strip mall. This is one of the sites that's probably going to be replaced by one of the many towers. We look at that as um, that does have a, it does, one of your favorite restaurants is in there. It is less expensive. It does cater to people on a budget. It also has parking. But what we're looking at is potentially yet another one of these towers, which can be criticized for a number of features that it does or doesn't have. Yeah, which is basically environmental. Uh, and social sensitivity or appropriateness, because in both areas, we need more ambition. And again, what you pointed out, my Cho Dang restaurant, uh, having to correct myself, last time I was saying they had to adjust their prices to inflation and things, but they're still hanging in there and offering the, the yummy um, kimchi stew with all these yummy side dishes for just under $10. This is a copy of my bank statement here that proves that. So once again, uh, where does that go? Where do these, where do places for 
people at the lower end of the food chain go, both as you know, feeding themselves and, and housing and sheltering themselves. This is one of the major challenges that we have on the island. And talking um, you know, raw models to learn from, not only is the El Moana building just there, however, as you said, unfortunately robbed uh, from his performative feathery cape of adjustable aluminum louvers. They were able to be open and closed following the sun. And that way being, you know, like a, like a kinetic, a bioclimatic, uh, you know, wonder. Uh, the, the, that cape was stolen in these 90s, by the way, which wasn't the greatest era either, where they just beefed up the AC system in there and then gave it some hideous, just ornamental, as you like to say, you know, other stuff on it, which isn't doing much anymore. But, um, you know, and I, I have to say, as coming from practice, and, and that just proves once again how innovative the El Moana building that was not by any talking star architects, Rem Kohlhaas, right, or Wolf Pricks. John Graham was not one of these. He was America's most commercial, people would say, boring architect. He was kind of a suit and tie guy, no offense to him. But, you know, to give him more credibility or credits, this guy was able to do such a top-notch thing that you know only people like Thomas Heatherwick at the Google headquarters who were pointing out at some many shows ago is suggesting something similar. But otherwise, good luck. Even you know architects high up there uh, suggesting something to their client would probably not work. And so, well, maybe if adjustable louvers you know wouldn't fly. But how about fixed static louvers? And we got another great precedent inspiration here. And we when we look at, you know, the probably the the the, the element that is the best of bioclimatic performance, that is a tree. But then you know, architects trying to learn from nature and live up to that, just behind that tree at the very bottom left, we see something glimpsing through and in the few uh, five minutes remaining time, please, to sort of tell us about that. And also with the next slide, that is something that is very close to you. Right. This is the Hawaiian Life Building built for an insurance company in the early 1950s. This was the first multi-story concrete building constructed on Kapiolani Boulevard. So historically, it's very important. It's also by Vladimir Osipov, who is a local architect, you might say, but in a positive way because of the many achievements he made during his lifetime as an architect. And this building relies on a very simple, very old process of essentially shutters. You can open it, you can't open and close these because these are fixed in place. But what they do is offer shading to the exterior of the building, depending, of course, on the position of the sun during the day and season of the year in which the sun is shining. But this does have, again, these vertical louvers, which do provide some protection from the sun. They don't move like the ones on the Ala Moana building used to when they were in existence. But still, this is a very simple, very basic, and very easy thing to design into a building, keeping in mind, of course, that you don't just put them on there for decoration, but you pay attention to where the sun is and how the building is oriented toward the sun to maximize how you can save energy and reduce glare at the same time as uh, being decorative in a good way, looking good, and looking like I think a building ought to look. Yeah, and who are we to uh, criticize Asipov? But I guess talking to optimize, this building is facing more south to, to the south side, the louvers uh, do a lot uh, early in the day and late in the afternoon to get that east and west sun. In midday, they're not doing too much. And so one could insert, however, some horizontal metal grading. It could look a lot of nondescript that could make up for that one. But we're not talking about retrofitting and Asipov building here. That is a landmark. The pictures, by the way, uh, the one at the bottom left is the only one we pulled from the web. This is sort of an interim condition that you remember it as soda, but I don't because that the rainbow color code is not original and was uh, when I wasn't on the island yet. And when I arrived, 
And the other picture at the top right is uh, what I took uh, when uh, we had a Dokomomo walking tour on the Magnificent Mile, which is the nickname of Kapilani Boulevard. And we had a bunch of architects. We were talking a couple of times about the great Frank Haynes, the architect of the unfortunately not there anymore Ken Rock building, uh, was touring that building. And here we had Sid Snyder, who was a late partner with Vladimir Osipov, who actually provided these drawings there, which are the original drawings uh, that he had with him. And I just uh, snapped the picture of that. And then the little a picture at the middle on the right um, is a little hard to tell, but that's a picture of the uh, lighting fixtures that are in this sort of covered walkway. And uh, it has a sort of flipping out lids that's sort of directing the light and also, you know, blocking you to be glared by the fluorescent light tube. So just as what Asipov is known for, some very, very fine, beautiful detailing here. And, you know, we can only hope that whoever owns that building here is highly aware of that and knows they, they, they have a gem. So um, we will, maybe we go to the next slide, although we don't have time to talk about it. So we just throw it in here as an appetizer um, because uh, this is just uh, further down that same road uh, going Mauka. And this is us uh, next week uh, revisiting uh, one of our favorite architects, John Hara with his daughter Mayumi. And in that case here also Mayumi's uh, grandfather and John's father, Ernest Para, who is very close to me because Osipov is very close to you because you are right now sitting in an Osipov that you grew up in. And I have been sitting and growing up um, as long, you know, ever since I came to the island uh, in an Ernest Hara building. And that is my Waikiki grant. And so that building in the background there, how that relates to the area and to the topics we're talking about. You have to wait until next week. And until then, please stay very inclusively exotic, exotically inclusive. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.